The first scripture today is Ruth 2, 1 through 13. Now Naomi had a kinsman on, on her man of the family of Imelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moite Mo, and said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, go my daughter, so she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Emelech. Just then Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. They answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? The ser servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her fa face to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered him, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, may I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. Here ends the reading of the word. Our reading continues in the book of Ruth, beginning at verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to Ruth, come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. That's about a bushel. She picked it up and came into the town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, otherwise you might be bothered in another field. 
So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests. And she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almost 20 years ago, an unnamed character in a mostly obscure comic strip with a niche audience was talking about her criteria for which movies she was willing to see. She said, I have this rule, see, I only go to a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements. One, it has to have at least two women in it, who, two, talk to each other about three, something besides a man. This little sentence, penned somewhat off-handedly by cartoonist Alison Bechtel, took on a life of its own. It came to be known as the Bechtel test, a kind of feminist litmus test for the full representation of women in art and culture. It's not that people who are interested in those things won't see anything unless it passes the test. Believe me, we'd be watching precious few movies and TVs if we did. But it's a useful tool. Not perfect, but consciousness raising. The Book of Ruth is one of just four books in the Bible that passes the Bechdel test. That means that Ruth contains at least two characters, in fact, there are three, who are women, who have names, and who have at least one conversation that is not about a man. This makes Ruth a remarkable book. It's a remarkable book written for a pivotal moment in the history of God's people. The opening sentence tells us that the story is set in the time of the judges, but scholars will tell you it was written much later, in the time of the return from the Babylonian exile, and that is important. This is the background for the Book of Ruth, also called the book, throughout the book, Ruth the Moabite. Ruth is not from Bethlehem in Judah. She is not a Jew. She is a foreigner. The names are important and revealing in the story. The book begins as the tale of a man, Elimelech, a name that means, my God is king. Though we don't have a God who intervenes directly in the story in obvious ways, there are no appearances of God to characters, for instance. We do have a story in which God's hand seems to be guiding people and determining outcomes. Elimelech sets out from Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and his two sons from Moab. They are being forced to flee to another land because there is a famine in Bethlehem. Some of this will be a repeat for those of you who came to Messy Sunday last week. Bethlehem is a Hebrew word that means house of bread. If there is a famine in the house of bread, that tells us something is very wrong. Things are upside down, topsy-turvy. And Elimelech's sons are named Melon and Chilion, which translate sickness and wasting. So that's not good. Still, they marry our heroine Ruth the Moabite, and Ruth's name means kindness. And another Moabite named, woman named Orpah, which can mean shadow or darkness. Naomi's name means pleasant. Here is why it matters that the book of Ruth was written at the end of the Babylonian exile. During their 60 years of captivity in Babylon, Jews were permitted, at the end, they were at last permitted to return to the land of Judah. But during the exile, the priests and the scholars of the people spent much time in study and prayer, attempting to figure out why God had allowed this terrible thing to happen to them, why they had been kidnapped from their land, lost their leaders, the temple had been destroyed. How could God let this happen? They determined that it was their own fault, that the people had worshiped other gods, and they laid much of the blame for that behavior on foreigners particularly intermarriage with foreigners. People of other ethnic backgrounds. As they returned from exile, strict laws went into effect prohibiting intermarriage between Jews and foreigners. Those who were already married 
were required to divorce, to split up their families. Jewish men were required to send away foreign wives and children. The Book of Ruth, said in another earlier time, is a story about an alien, a foreign wife, Ruth the Moabite. Back to the story. All three men die, leaving behind all three women as widows, and Naomi also becomes a mother who has lost her sons. In our day, this would be considered, of course, a tragedy of the greatest proportions. The depth of pain and loss for any family who loses one member is great. This family's been hit particularly hard. But there's more than the human emotional toil of grief and loss. There's also the social reality of what it meant to be a woman in that era. These three women have fallen into a nightmare. In this ancient world, women without men to protect and care for them are incredibly vulnerable. They're in constant danger, danger of starvation, danger of being kidnapped and sold as slaves. They can't go out and get a job to support themselves. Well, they could, but there's only one job out there for them, and that's not really a job any woman wants. Naomi, as the matriarch of the tiny, decimated family, makes a decision. They'll return to Bethlehem because there's news that the land is producing food again. The famine is over. There's bread again in the house of bread. Their best hope lies in returning to the land of Naomi's birth, the place where they might find food and family. And then there's a struggle. Naomi lets it be known that even this decision is not foolproof. Her conscience is telling her, don't drag these young women along with you. There are no guarantees here. Naomi's words to them are heartbreaking. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Naomi puts herself in the same category as the dead. Naomi's all but dead herself. When Ruth and Orpah protest, she refutes their pleas with dark humor about the unlikely scenario of her giving birth to sons again so that they could grow up and marry these young women. No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Naomi cannot account for all that has happened except to believe that God has turned away from her. She is bitter. She is a shell of her former self. She is empty. Orpa weeps and kisses her mother-in-law and heads down the road toward her parents' home. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There, I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. Ruth is a remarkable character in a remarkable book. She chooses to throw in her lot with another woman against all reasonable assessments of possible risks and rewards. She chooses further to bind herself with a covenant vow to someone who is to her a foreigner. Now those of you who were here last Sunday, again, I apologize for repeating myself, but this is really worth understanding. The statement, may the Lord do thus and so to me, was surely accompanied by a gesture, a gesture like this or this. May the Lord do thus and so to me, if even death parts me from you. This is covenant language. In Hebrew, it always talks about cutting a covenant because covenants are always sealed in blood one way or another. Ruth has promised on her own blood to stay with her foreigner mother-in-law who is also a different religion and a woman. No pro-con list would have resulted in this choice. What could Naomi do? 
The two women, Judean mother-in-law and Moabite daughter-in-law, head back to Bethlehem. They arrive at the beginning of the barley harvest. By the time they get there, their stomachs are as empty as their hearts. So the first concern is food. Ruth the Moabite offers to go to a barley field to glean. Gleaning was a practice in ancient Israel and Judah that was codified into law. It simply means picking up the kernels that fell during the harvest, the stuff that landed on the ground. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it's mandated when farmers gather their crops, their barley, their wheat, their grapes, and if they drop things on the ground, if they leave a sheaf by accident, they are to leave it there. They are not to strip the plants bare. Some parts of the law say, leave the edges unpicked. These gleanings are for the poor. They are for widows. They are for orphans. They are for aliens, those we might call illegal immigrants, people who have no particular right to be there. Sometimes the text explains, you'll be blessed if you do this. Other times, it simply says, I am the Lord your God. We provide for those who are hungry because this is what the people of God do. Ruth goes to glean by coincidence or by providence, that quietly guiding hand of God. It turns out that the field she gleans in is owned by one Boaz. His name means strength. He's related to Naomi's dead husband, and Boaz notices Ruth, and he asks questions about her, and he learns of her loyalty and her dedication to Naomi, his relative by marriage. He learns that she's been gathering the gleanings of barley since first thing in the morning without stopping. Boaz speaks to Ruth, and he tells her to stay in his field, stay near his people for protection. He gives her some food to fill her empty stomach and some kind words to fill her empty heart. And when she returns to the place where she and Naomi have been staying, her report of the day fills Naomi with hope. For the first time since she was reeling with the emptiness of her sorrow and her loss. As we end chapter two, we know there will be bread on Ruth and Naomi's table once again. And we know that Naomi sees even greater hopes for fullness, both for herself and her daughter-in-law. It has been a devastating summer, this summer of 2014. All around the world, there are wars and rumors of war. Israel and Palestine seem this morning to be abiding by their uneasy ceasefire. The streets of Ferguson, Missouri are still ringing out with gunfire after a young unarmed black man was killed again and police responded with military force to peaceful protests, which then turned violent and then turned into opportunistic looting. In Iraq, the ISIS forces continue to terrorize Christians as well as other specific ethnic groups. And these are just the stories in the news. These are the headlines. One theme runs through all these headlines. The theme is conflict based on difference. The difference may be religion, it may be ethnicity, it may be color. These are old, old fights, many of them. But in each case, thinking humans are for the most part choosing to align themselves tribally. They speak of those people when describing the actions of people they disagree with. The Book of Ruth tells another story. This is a cool breeze blowing over our boiling landscape of anger. This is a story that tells of love and commitment across the boundaries that ordinarily divide us. This tells of a woman from the region that today is part of Jordan who gives her life and loyalty to another woman who today would be from what we call Israel. The story was written at a time when immigrants, aliens, were demonized and when they were blamed 
for everything that was wrong with post-exile society. The story was written to offer another perspective, one that holds to the notion that, as one writer put it, biological family is too small a vision. Patriotism is too myopic. A love for our own relatives and a love for the people of our own country are not bad things, but our love does not stop at the border. The story of Ruth is the story of love that does not stop at the border. It's a story of human beings giving one another a chance, ignoring the walls that normally divide them, even those walls their religion is telling them to put up. It's a story of radical commitment against all odds that gives God's quiet, powerful hand an opportunity to take those who were empty and make them full again. Thanks be to God. Amen.